All right, let's dive straight in. We're here to talk about the escalating conflict right at the heart of digital privacy, what we're calling the anonymity arms race. And you know, this isn't some static field. It's a dynamic battlefield where privacy tech and de-anonymization techniques are locked in this constant state of co-evolution. So in this explainer, we're going to break down the trajectory of this fight all the way from its foundations to the really sophisticated behavioral and network level attacks that define the landscape today. So our starting point is this quote taken right from a leaked NSA presentation. And it's a pretty candid admission, right? It shows that even for a global adversary, robust anonymity networks pose a significant persistent challenge. This really frames our discussion. It's not just a theoretical exercise. This is a real world strategic struggle with incredibly high stakes. For an adversary, the goal is clear. Even if total de-anonymization is off the table, getting partial or even intermittent success, well, that still counts as a strategic win. Now, to really understand the attacks we're seeing now, we have to go back and revisit the foundational problem these networks were built to solve in the first place. You know, in a standard connection, your IP address is just out there, exposed. It's the primary vulnerability, directly linking your network activity to a physical location and ultimately your identity. The whole point of that first generation of anonymity networks was to sever that link and to resist basic traffic analysis by hiding the path between you and your destination. And the three foundational systems that emerged, Tor, I2P, and Freenet, they all tackled this problem with pretty different philosophies. Tor, of course, used onion routing to wrap traffic in multiple layers of encryption. It was optimized for low latency web access, and it became the most widely adopted by far. Then you had I2P, which focused on creating a self-contained anonymous network, a network within a network, if you will. It used what's called garlic routing to bundle multiple messages together for extra security. And Freenet took a totally different path, architecting a censorship-resistant peer-to-peer distributed data store. These are the incumbents, the established systems whose defenses are now being systematically targeted by much more advanced techniques. This is where the game really changes. The strategic pivot by adversaries is the critical development here. They realize that trying to break the core cryptography is just computationally prohibitive. So their focus shifted. The modern attack surface isn't the encrypted tunnel itself. It's the metadata and the user behaviors that are leaking from its endpoints. The goal now is to completely bypass network level anonymity by fingerprinting the user, not the connection. So that brings us to the central technical question of modern de-anonymization. If a user's IP is totally masked by a network like Tor, what vectors for identification are even left? Well, the answer is to shift the focus from network identity to behavioral identity. The unique measurable patterns of how a human interacts with a device, that provides an incredibly rich source of data for creating a persistent digital fingerprint. These denominization vectors really operate at different layers of the stack. You've got traffic correlation and timing attacks, which target the network layer trying to match traffic patterns at the entry and exit nodes. Then there's TLS fingerprinting, which analyzes the unique quirks of a client's TLS handshake to identify their software stack. But the most insidious vector and in our focus for the next few minutes is behavioral biometrics. This is an attack that operates entirely at the user level, completely independent of whatever network protocol you're using. Let's be really precise about what we mean here. Behavioral biometrics is the science of identifying you based on the unique, measurable patterns in your actions. It's not about what you do, but how you do it. These patterns can be analyzed to build a statistical fingerprint that stays consistent across different sessions, different accounts, even different anonymity networks. It completely transcends your IP address. It becomes a signature of the human operator behind the keyboard. Keystroke dynamics is a pretty mature field within behavioral biometrics. See, just by using simple JavaScript event listeners, a web app can capture incredibly high-resolution timing data for every single key you press. It measures metrics like dwell time, how long you hold a key down, and flight time, the tiny interval between releasing one key and pressing the next. When you combine that with your overall typing cadence, your common error patterns, and even your inferred keyboard layout, you can create a high-dimensional feature vector that can uniquely identify a user with pretty alarming accuracy. But the keyboard is only half the story. The mouse, which seems like such an innocuous tool, actually provides an even richer, more continuous stream of biometric data. The subtle, subconscious patterns in how a user moves a cursor around are just as unique as a handwritten signature, and they are far, far more difficult to consciously change. And don't think for a second that this is all theoretical. Research from 2023 shows that as many as 36% of the top 80,000 websites may already be deploying scripts with mouse fingerprinting capabilities. This is an active, large-scale data collection effort that's happening right now out in the wild. 
And while it's often framed as being from marketing analytics, it has obvious dual use potential for de-anonymization, creating these massive databases of behavioral signatures that can be used to track users all across the web. So mouse fingerprinting analyzes a different set of features. A cursor's path is never a perfectly straight line. It has a unique curvature. Your movement speed, acceleration, how you use the scroll wheel, the duration of your hovers and clicks, it all contributes to this comprehensive profile. An AI model trained on this data can easily link an anonymous session on Tor to a known user profile from the public internet, the clearnet, just by matching the biometric signature of their mouse movements. Okay, so the emergence of this threat vector obviously required a new class of defensive tools. If the human operator is now the vulnerability, then the defense has to focus on obfuscating or normalizing their input before it can be measured. This is what we call an endpoint defense strategy. A tool like Cloak is designed for exactly this. It basically functions as an input device anonymizer. So first, it intercepts the raw hardware events from your keyboard and mouse, Second, it disrupts the timing signals by introducing a semi-random delay to your keystrokes. Third, for mouse movements, it obfuscates the path by merging lots of small movements into larger, less precise jumps. And finally, it releases this sanitized input stream to the operating system. The whole goal is just to inject enough noise to completely break the patterns that those fingerprinting algorithms rely on. But, and this is a big but, this approach introduces a really critical trade-off. It moves you from what we call a virtual personality to a shared personality. See, an ideal defense would make every user look like a brand new, random individual every time. Cloak doesn't do that. Instead, it makes all of its users look weirdly similar to each other. The resulting input pattern is unnatural and algorithmically distinct, creating an easily identifiable fingerprint for a Cloak user. It's a lot like the classic Tor browser problem. An observer can't identify which Tor user you are, but they can easily identify that you are a Tor user. You're just trading individual identifiability for group identifiability. So the limitations of endpoint defenses like Cloak really highlight the need for more robust network-level solutions. The next phase in this arms race involves re-architecting the anonymity network itself, with a design philosophy built from the ground up to resist a global passive adversary. That's an entity that's capable of observing all traffic entering and exiting the entire network. And here we see a really fundamental design divergence. Tor's onion routing is optimized for low latency, which, you know, is essential for web browsing. Packets flow through a predetermined circuit as fast as possible. But that very optimization creates a vulnerability to end-to-end -to -end timing correlation. A next-generation mixnet like NIME makes a completely different trade-off. It is explicitly optimized for metadata resistance. It sacrifices low latency in order to introduce mechanisms that make timing correlation computationally infeasible, even for a global adversary. So the NIM architecture deploys a layered defense against traffic analysis. First, all data is encapsulated in uniform-sized packets using the Sphinx format. That completely eliminates size as a correlation factor. Second, cover traffic is constantly injected into the network, which creates this baseline of noise that masks the timing of any real communication. And crucially, each mix node introduces a variable delay and reorders packets, breaking that temporal link between input and output. And finally, the network topology itself is dynamic. It reconfigures every hour to prevent an adversary from gaining a persistent strategic view of traffic flows. So to summarize the progression, if we zoom out, you can see this clearer pattern. The 2000s, that was the establishment of foundational networks like Tor, which were effective against localized adversaries. The 2010s revealed the true capabilities of the global adversary, making simple onion routing vulnerable to large-scale correlation. This in turn prompted endpoint defenses like Cloak to counter behavioral fingerprinting. And now, in the 2020s, we're seeing the architectural response, next-gen mixnets engineered from the start to defeat that global passive adversary threat model. Each phase is a direct reaction to the capabilities that were demonstrated in the last. And all of this brings us to a final critical question. As surveillance becomes completely pervasive and AI-driven analytics become exponentially more powerful, is the future of privacy just destined to be a permanent escalating arms race? It really seems like every defensive innovation is met with an even more sophisticated offensive technique, just pushing the conflict to new layers, from the network to the endpoint, and then right back again. And this forces us to consider a future where the ultimate choice isn't just about which tool you use, but what you're willing to trade, the near-perfect high-latency privacy of these next-gen mixnets, or the convenience of low-latency systems that are just going to remain perpetually in the crosshairs.